In the early 1900s, the town of Van Meter, Iowa was terrorized by something crazy. Extraterrestrials? An albatross? Absolutely, completely fabricated in the name of tourism? What in the world was the Van Meter Visitor? That's what we're looking at today, here at the Insomnia Society. This story first comes from the Des Moines Daily News, Sunday, October 4th, 1903 and begins early in the morning of September 29th. A man named U.G. Griffith is on his way home from work when he notices a bright light on the roof of Mather and Gregg's building in the business district. This is odd, he thinks to himself, and fearing it might be burglars, he approaches. As he sneaks up to the building, he notices the light jump from one rooftop across the street to another rooftop and then blink away into the night. Obviously, it's not burglars, and it's late, so he goes home to go to bed. The next day, he recounts his story to the other locals, but like today, not many take him seriously. Just in case, the local authorities checked for signs of a prowler, but none were ever found, something that was liable to change the coming night. In the early morning hours of September 30th, thunderclouds rumbled onto the horizon, and Dr. Alcott, the town's local doctor, was nice and warm in bed in the back of his office. He's almost asleep when he's awoken by a bright, unnatural light filling his room. He could tell it was no one looking for help and grabbed his gun and lantern and headed outside to confront the visitor for himself. Rushing into the rain, what he saw terrified him. Clinging to the brickwork outside of his window was a monster half-human, half-bird, with large bat-like wings. It turned its head toward him, which inadvertently blinded him with the light emitting from the horn on top of its head. But not before he got a good look at its face, and its beak filled with razor-sharp teeth. He's scared, obviously, at this point, and fires five rounds at the creature, keeping one in the chamber just in case. As the smoke clears, he sees the creature still standing, unhurt, and to his horror, it still sees him. He runs back into his office, and he bolts the doors and windows, and sits sleepless in terror until the break of dawn. Now that a doctor is involved, people start to take a little bit more notice. But Clarence Dunn, the bank teller, isn't having any of it. It's the early morning of October 1st, and he pulled his coat tighter around himself as he walked to the bank. He had heard the stories muttering through town, but he wasn't afraid of any monster. He was much more afraid of thieves. Seeing a good way to get a raise, he had taken an offer to guard the bank where he worked. Him and his shotgun settled in for the night, and it wasn't long before the church bells chimed out 1am. But the sounds of the bells were intertwined with another, a rasping, wheezing noise like a man being strangled underwater. He moved towards the window, trying to get a better look. Instantly, he was blinded by a bright light. In absolute terror, he shot. The blast sent him recoiling back into his chair and sent shattering glass into the street. He got up and steadied himself, but the light was gone, with nothing to be found but a set of three-toed tracks in the damp earth the next day. So now everyone's in a slight panic. This is the third highly respected member of Van Meter to see something in just as many days. And it's a small town, so word gets around quick. It's now the night of October 1st, and Mr. White, a local businessman, is in bed above his store. He's rudely awoken to something other than the light rain against his window. Almost, he thinks to himself, like the sound of a man choking. Hearing the stories of the bank, he grabs his gun and slowly slides over to the window. Opening it, he scanned around for the source of the noise. The rasping came again, and he noticed the creature sleeping curled in its wings, perched on the cross member of a telephone pole. Known for being a good shot, he slid the barrel into the night. There was an ear-splitting crack, and in the same moment he was blinded by a bright flash. A pungent odor overtook him, and from that point, he didn't remember a single thing. Across the street in another store, a man named Sidney Gregg was awoken by someone firing off a gun. He went to his door to see what was going on and saw the creature lurching its way down the telephone pole. He only had a second to pull himself back into his doorway as the bright light of the monster swept by, looking for the source of the shot. 
The creature noticed Mr. White paralyzed in his upstairs window, and it began bounding towards his shop like a kangaroo. But on this night, like it normally does, the mail train came hurtling through town blaring its horn. This startled the visitor, scaring it off into the night sky, where it headed right in the direction of the broken down coal mine. People didn't believe it was fake anymore. More came forward saying that they had seen the creature, and the men of the brick factory finally spoke up. Not wanting to scare anyone, they had kept hidden that day and night they had been hearing awful noises coming from the old mines next to the factory. In the early morning hours of October 3rd, the owner of the brick factory, J.L. Platt Jr., was on the graveyard shift. His father was the one that had built the mines, and since the noises had died down a little, he wanted to take a look. Getting close to the mouth of the cave, he was suddenly blinded and fell backwards. Towering above him was the visitor, and from his vantage on the ground, he could see another, smaller visitor standing right behind it. They lunged at him, and he could feel their wings flapping against his body. Not wanting to see their paycheck soar off into the sky, some of the men of the factory grabbed bricks and rushed at the creatures. They flew off, leaving Platt shaken, but unharmed. Accidentally, he had done it, and they had found its lair. So, now it was time for their ambush. The men ran to town, gathering people and supplies along the way. Women and children lit every available lamp, and every electric light in town was turned on. If the visitor did decide to show up here, it would have nowhere to hide. A group of men gathered at the entrance of the mine, waiting for the creature to appear, but to their surprise, nothing showed. So they waited patiently through the night. As morning started to appear over the horizon, one of the men shouted, Silhouetted in the morning light, they saw two shapes flying towards them. It was the visitors, and the men let loose a barrage, the sounds of their gunfire mixing with the horrendous screeching of the beasts. They let out flashes of bright light and a pungent odor that mixed with the gun smoke polluting the air. Terrified, the men watched the two creatures descend, unhurt, and casually stroll through the entrance of the mine. Now knowing that they were powerless to stop it, they did the only thing left that they could think of, and took every timber that they could find and boarded up the old mine shaft, imprisoning the creatures forever inside. Alright, so what was that? We have an 8 foot tall, half human, half bat with a tooth fanged beak, a bright horn on the top of its head, and can release a gas that knocks you out. This was all reported by prominent members of the Van Meter Society. So what else could it have possibly been? Let's take a quick look at a couple of the cryptids that might be this thing's cousin. So first off, we have the Snallygaster. It's a half bird, half reptile, maybe part machine thing that has a large metallic beak filled with teeth. It also makes noises like a rusted freight train and seems not to be harmed by human weapons. It was first seen in Maryland by a bunch of terrified German settlers in the 1730s and supposedly now lives in the caves of South Mountain. In 1909, there was an uptick of sightings and attacks, and a rather odd scientific expedition was taken to uncover the creature. After that, it wasn't seen again for many years. If you want to see a definitive breakdown of the Snallygaster and other crazy paranormal stories, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of the wild paranormal world. Alright, next we have another winged monstrosity. The Jersey Devil of the New Jersey Pine Barrens. He's normally known as a flying biped with hooves and the head of a horse, but he actually goes by many different descriptions. He was originally born as the cursed offspring of a mother that already had won too many mulds to feed. And because he was cursed, when he was born, he had bat-like wings and he flew out the chimney into the stormy night. Now he makes his home in the wetlands of the Pine Barrens. Some people report him with claws, Sometimes he looks like a pterosaur, and on the rare occasions he looks like a dragon. In 1903, accounts of the devil stopped, and they didn't pick back up again until 1909. Even though neither of these cryptids are a direct match, both of their sightings picked back up again in 1909, so they could have been on vacation in Van Meter together. We might never know. During this time, there were numerous sightings of giant flying creatures, there were flying dragons in Texas and Kansas, flying crocodiles in California, and Thunderbird sightings of Native American legend. 
And in 1903, just three weeks before the Van Meter sightings, two hunters in Utah ran into an unexpected creature. It was half bird, half reptile with large bat-like wings. They tracked it for a few days and reported it carrying a horse into a nearby cave, which is the same home as our friend the visitor. It became known as the Stansbury Island creature. It was considered to be a pterosaur type creature, which is sometimes how people depict the visitor. But one issue we have here is that they judged it to be about 50 feet long, which is about two school buses in length, quite a bit bigger than the Van Meter visitor. There's another more recent story from Utah that was recounted to researcher Jonathan D. Whitcomb. At 11 p.m. August 2001 in Grantsville, Utah, three children saw a glowing dinosaur-looking bird in the sky. It continued to disappear and reappear into the night, turning the glow on and off. I did some digging and I found an account that seems to share similarities with this one. It comes from the Irish Nationalist, volume 20, circa 1911. A ferryman of Villiers Town pointed out what he had been seeing in the sky over multiple nights. Lights would dash irregularly along the hills, blinking in and out only to reappear later in a different place further away. It was seen multiple times, and although they never saw definitive birds glowing in the sky, the ferryman was a former gamekeeper, and he was positive that what they were seeing was the movement of birds. This to me seems like it could have almost been UFO sightings, which leads us nicely into our next topic, of aliens. Something we see a lot in alien encounters gone wrong is them being impervious to human weapons. Multiple times the men of Van Meter fired at the creature, and each time it just shrugged it off. We also have the use of paralytic gas on Mr. White, which knocked him out and he didn't remember anything more of the encounter. Oftentimes in abduction cases, the abductee won't remember what had happened and has to undergo hypnosis to remember details that they've suppressed. We also have the use of an animal motif and false memories, which is sometimes seen in alien cases. People will claim to see large, big-headed animals, such as birds, squirrels, deer, and more which they later recall as not being an animal at all, but an alien in disguise. Aliens are so odd, unique, and varied that it's possible that it could have been one of them. But let's take a look at a natural explanation really quick. So it's not an albatross, but this is the whooping crane. It stands at five feet tall and used to thrive in Iowa. Let's do a comparison. It's fairly tall, but it needs feathers to fly. So, if it was some sort of deformed, unfeathered bird, it wouldn't have been able to soar away like it did. But what about the horn? Well, this is a white pelican, which can also be found in Iowa. And, it just so happens that during mating season, the males grow a blunted horn on the top of their beaks. So, could this horn have reflected the light of their lanterns, giving it the appearance of a glow? Sure. Could multiple high-ranking members of Van Meter have mistaken an angry bird for a massive humanoid bat creature? Definitely. Especially if they were the ones fabricating the entire thing. So there's always the theory that the whole thing was a hoax. The original story was given to the Des Moines Daily News by H.H. H. Phillips, the recently titled Postmaster of Van Meter. He was the one person who documented all of the accounts, so it's only his word that we have to go off of. Seeing the story published in the news must have upset someone, because an anonymous townsperson used the same paper to write a rebuttal the next day, claiming that Mr. Dunn had indeed fired at a bright light through the window, but it was nothing more than a practical joke or a robbery gone wrong, and Mr. Phillips had used his imagination to create something more newsworthy. This was followed up two days later with a complaint in another paper, the Des Moines Daily Capital, who stated they had numerous townspeople writing them letters claiming the whole thing had been blown out of proportion. Now, this is odd because it does confirm that people had been seeing odd lights, and Mr. Dunn had fired out the bank window. But if Phillips was going to fabricate a story, why would he include such high-ranking people? Surely they'd all be upset if he'd smeared their reputation. Well, there is one piece of corroborating evidence. It's called the bachelor's photo. And many of those to witness the creature are featured here, including Mr. White, Sidney Gregg, and Eugene Griffith, along with postmaster H.H. H. Phillips. 
and with each one of the witnesses being prominent businessmen of the town, it's not unlikely that they knew each other. The story goes that the mine that was owned by the Platt family had been closed for years, and the loss in revenue had hit the town hard. Working together, the men staged the lights and encounters over a few days, hoping the stories would bring curious people and their money to the town. So, what was it the people of Van Meter saw a hundred years ago? Something dredged up from the mines? An out-of-this-world explorer? Or were they taken by something much more human? Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video and want to see more, make sure to click the like, subscribe, and notification bell so you don't miss another episode from the Insomnia Society. It gets weird out there, so stay safe, guys.